Hey everybody, it's uh, this is the second shot at recording uh, the second lecture from Friday uh, the 24th. I'm sorry that uh, uh, the original recording didn't take very well, it got stuck. And I think this is, um, uh, this is just technological problems that I have to solve. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's just overloading the bandwidth of the computer or the cables or whatever, but I'm going to give it a slightly different version right now. I'm going to actually just do it TED style in front of the projector and see if we can get a whole take that way. Uh, so thanks for your patience. In the original lecture, I talked a little bit about this, uh, this um, uh, word plot that we made, and I emphasized the fact that we had a lot of, in, in, a lot of people entered the same kind of you know, standard known fish, a lot of food fish you know, in the middle. And then a lot of weird fish on the outside. We had some, we had some kind of entertaining, um, some entertaining entries here, which I'm just gonna kind of speed through here. Start casting fringe head, a fossil fish, um, another fossil fish, and then a bony eared ass fish. And I like, cracked some jokes about that. And that's more live and water, beautiful. And then a washi washi, which was <laughs> a Nintendo fish. Um, but I wanna, and then the other thing is that. I wanted to do a Canvas checkup, so I had everybody enter in the participation score for September 24th, and I exhorted people to get in touch with me. For some reason, they couldn't enter the participation score, either for, uh, for today or for Tuesday, because this is an essential part of the class. You need to be able to enter stuff in Canvas to be able to, to make it through the class. So let's figure it out now. There's no shame in asking questions, obviously. Obviously, I struggle too with the technology, and so uh, we will all struggle together. But please be in communication with me. You're not going to be penalized for not getting it right now, but later, if you need to, if you need to do something and you can't get it in, well, then it could be you know much more consequential if you're trying to take a quiz or a test or whatever. Okay, um, so I'll let you do that on your own time. Get in touch with me if it doesn't work, and then I promise to fly through the. The sort of taxonomic order uh, of the class that we'll kind of live and die by, hopefully not die, but we'll live and, and eat and breathe uh, in the course of the class. And I introduced this taxonomy on um, Wednesday, and I'm coming back to this chart because this table is an essential piece of information. And one of the things I wanted to point out about it is that the uh, the dots below each each taxonomic heading here mean continuation of that heading. So uh, everything on this plot below the agnatha is a nathostome. And everything below the Actinob Actinopterygii, which are the ray fin fishes, is, is a ray fin fish, uh, all the way down to the Acanthopterygii, which are the most derived group of uh, fishes that we'll be looking at. So anyway, all this does is indicate everything below is one of them. Uh, here at the Lasmobranchs, this one, you know, Lasmobranchs has one entry below it. Those are the squalia, the galea are the standard sharks they used to, the squalia are, are skates and rays. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, the first uh, class that I want you to know are the Mixini, or Agnath, they're of the Agnathids, which are the jawless fishes. Uh, and so the first group is Mixini, which are the hagfishes. Uh, they have a skull, but they don't really have true vertebrae. Although at a point in their uh, development, they develop a notochord, uh, making them part of the chordata. Um, but they don't really have bone structure and they lack a lower jaw. And so they have these teeth, these bony teeth-like structures that are grow out of the skull, which they use for feeding on decomposing or dead uh, organisms at the bottom, the bottom of the sea. Um, <clears throat> because they're boneless, uh, hagfish have, uh, are able to tie themselves into a knot to apply leverage while they shove their head into the decaying carcass and pull out a jawful or half a jawful of decaying matter. And uh, it gives them a little leverage and they produce copious amounts of slime. I've talked about the slime. I'll keep talking about it, I guess. It's of interest to material scientists who are trying to figure out what to do with something that is that slimaceous and sturdy and fluid all at the same time. The other agnathin, there's only really one other uh, major group or class are the petrozymontidids, and those are lamprey. There's many different species of lamprey. Um, we have our own Pacific lamprey, which uh, is an anadromous fish like salmon. They spawn upstream, and this is an old tiny picture of a whole bunch of lamprey. Uh, running up a river, uh, river somewhere, they have these, these uh, toothy sucking, uh, sucking mouth, not jaws, but a sucking mouth that they use to attach to fish. 
and they basically suck on their vital juices. And, um, and they use that same structure to be able to grab onto rocks and uh, go up these falls on their upriver migration. It's a pretty impressive thing to see. I've never seen that many in one spot, but I have seen lamprey going upriver and it is like a really cool and mysterious thing. Um, the rest of what we call fishes, those fishy things are the nathostomes, including us as walking, uh, living, walking, breathing uh, tetrapods. Uh, were nathostomes. Uh, and the first, let's see, the, the, the first group that I want to talk about up here are the chondrichthys, which are characterized by the fact that they have a paralyzing skeleton and they lack swim bladders. And then the, everything else from the sarcopterygii and the acanthop or the actinopterygii, everything else um, are called the osteichthians. It's not a, it, it's not a formal, uh, class. It's not necessarily a formal taxonomic de uh, designation anymore, but what it does tell you is that the sarcopterygii, excuse me, that chondrichthia uh, are cartilaginous fishes and everything else is an osteichthian. The sarcopterygii and the actinopterygii all have bony, well, bony bones. They have ossified bones with calcium. Uh, uh, integrated into the matrix. So cartilaginous fishes, the chondrichthys, everything else are the osteichthys. Uh, the sarcopterygii are low fin fishes with flexible joints, and the actinopterygii is the second group of osteichthians, which are called the ray fin fishes. And uh, I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about the chondrichthys and then work my way through this chart. The holocephali are an interesting and somewhat unknown group of bottom dwelling uh, fishes called the chimeras or ratfish. Um, they live on the, they live in the benthos in the bottom uh, of the sea. They feed on benthic invertebrates. They swim with their pectoral fins, which is something that uh, sharks don't typically do. And uh, they split off from the sharks many, many millions of years, 420 or so million years ago. They're very distinct species. They're actually really quite beautiful when they're alive in person. And then when they're brought up, they, they fade to a weird, dull color. And these, these pictures don't really capture even the living ones. Uh, and then uh, the rest of the chondrichthys are the elasmobranchs. The elasmobranchs include the galia sharks, the galeid sharks, and the squaleids, which are um, skates and rays, like bat rays. Um, the galia uh, are characterized by um, stiff fins. Um, and, uh, and they swim with their tail or caudal fins, but typically the pectoral fins, the dorsal fin, and the pelvic claspers on these sharks are, are stiff and rigid and they're designed to essentially keep the shark um, waterborne as they swim forward because sharks lack a swim bladder. Because of that, they, well, they need to keep moving. In order to keep moving, it helps create lift with the uh, fins and um, keeps them suspended in the water column. The uh, teleostean fishes um, evolved a, a swim bladder, which makes it much more effective and, and it makes it less energy intensive for them to be able to maintain position in the water column because they don't have to swim. Of uh, the squalid elasmobranchs are of the rays and the skates, um, and they differ from the galeids because they have very flexible pectoral fins that are attached to the head and they lack a nictitating membrane, which is a little clear membrane that can fold over to protect the eyes of the galeid sharks. And it's a very useful thing for a predator to have. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, man, you see here, manta rays, a bat ray, and a, um, I believe that's a, a shovel nose guitar shark. Um, down to the osteichthians now, the bony fishes. And uh, the bony fishes include the sarcopterygii. The sarcopterygii include the coelacanthomorphs or the coelacanthus or the coelacanths. It's, it's a little late on Friday, so I'm stuttering a little. Uh, the coelacanths were known uh, from only from fossils originally. And then in the early part of the 20th century, I think in the 1930s, a live coelacanth was captured off the coast of South Africa, I believe. And then subsequently in the 50s or 60s, maybe later, they caught a different species um, somewhere in Indonesia. And so what makes these fishes unique is that 
Um, their fins are, have a sort of knuckle. They're a lobe fin fish. So they have this fleshy uh, appendage that has a knuckle in it. And that sort of appendage is um, what characterizes essentially our ancestors or the tetrapod ancestors. And so this has often been called uh, the missing link of tetrapods. Uh, as it turns out, it shares a common ancestor with the lungfishes here. The lungfishes are probably more accurately described as the true sister group to the tetrapods um, because they have lung-like structures and, um, and they have the lobe fins. And, um, and so they're considered, uh, of the Sarcopterygia, they each have a common ancestor. Um, the lobe fin fishes are the sister group to the tetrapods. So this would be our most recent common ancestor that we know of. Um, I'm sorry, that's not entirely accurate. It's actually, I should say that both the lobe fin fishes and the tetrapods have a common ancestor. And then the group as an entirety has another common ancestor. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, if, if you're confused about it and you want to know more, ask me. And if you want to more loose it up, you don't have to talk to you about it. Um, and then there's the tetrapods that evolved uh, from the, they evolved legs from those knuckle-like joints and they became all the other critters that, that we study in wildlife, uh, including ourselves. Um, so the actinopterygii are the ray fin fishes. They're characterized by bony or honey structures, which are rays. Those rays are separated by a membrane. And so their fin-like structures don't have, they don't have bony joints in them. They simply have these rays that articulate with the skeleton directly. And they offer a high degree of movement and control and that allowed for an adaptive radiation to occur. And so these newly evolved actinopterygii fishes began radiating in kind of amazing and unusual ways. Um, the main groups that we're going to be looking at are the Cladistia uh, or the Bashirs, uh, the Chondrostii, which include the sturgeons and paddlefishes, which secondarily lost their bony skeleton and became, um, had, became uh, cartilaginous, or their skeletons became cartilaginous. The Neopterygians or the bowfins, and then the Teleos, which are the modern fishes. So let's run through those kind of quick. Hopefully not too quickly here, but somewhat quickly. So the cladistia or the bashirs are these aguilliform or eel-shaped fishes with heterocircle tails. So the tails are not symmetrical, vertical to dorsal. Um, they, the, the, the spine goes up into the dorsal side of it. And that's a key point that we'll come back to. The difference between a heterocircle tail or an asymmetrical tail and a homocircle tail or a symmetrical tail, which is another key adaptation of the evolution of fishes. Um, the bodies are heavily uh, armored. These are African fishes. The mouth is very similar to those of the tetrapods, which is not surprising because they're kind of an ancestral fish. Uh, they have these really beautiful dorsal finlets and they have breathing spiracles as well, which sets them apart from any other group. And then the chondrostii, which I said, um, uh, re-evolved a cartilaginous skeleton. These are, um, these fishes uh, lack scales, but they have very heavy bony scutes and face plates as well. And so probably the reason that they lost scales was to try to lighten up, uh, to, to compensate for the armor, which was, it's rather heavy. And by losing a bony or ossified skeleton, they also made, they also, uh, essentially lightened their loads so that those they have this heavy armor, but they're not so burdened down with uh, these hard, heavy structures that they can't swim. And so this is their strategy, this particular group's strategy for being able to balance the need for armored protection with the ability to move effectively. And as we'll see in the future, uh, as we go down towards the teleosteans, they evolved a different strategy of, of predator protection and while still maintaining, uh, maintaining uh, a light body type and flexibility. Uh, the Neopterygians are also an ancient fish. They include the gars. This is an alligator gar. And the bowfins, there's only one extant species left. They're also very heavily armored. They have heavy scales and plates, but they retain the bony skeleton. Uh, they have a slightly more symmetrical caudal fin, which allows them a little more uh, uh, propulsion 
to uh, move that heavy armored body. Um, but in general, they're very large, they're slow moving, they're really powerful ambush predators, but they're not real light on their fins. And the, the garfish that I have known just I, when I worked at an aquarium many years ago, those suckers, they're about three or four feet long and they just hung out there in the water as still as possible, like pretending to be logs essentially. And when someone would splash water or throw food at them, they would just go snap. And it, would, it was shocking. Everyone would jump because these giant jaws would open up and close. And that's what they do. That's how they get a living. Very still, except for short bursts of movement where they just kind of overwhelm their small prey item, whether it be a fish, uh, an insect, a bird, or a small child. Um, and then the, the, the fourth major group of the Actinopterygians are the teleosts or the teleostii. It includes all the other fishes. It's the predominant group of fishes alive today. And we call the teleosts, we call them the modern fishes. And by that, we mean that they've evolved uh, further adaptations. They're more derived from the ancestral fishes because they, de they developed light bony scales for protection, for armor, um, which made them much more flexible and able to move more quickly and radiate, adaptively radiate in different directions. And they developed a completely symmetrical caudal fin, which helped with propulsion. And the development of these two primary structures really kind of precipitated the evolutionary radiation that occurred and, and really continues to today. And this group includes several uh, orders or super orders that I'm gonna run through and you're gonna be expected to know. You don't need to know it all today, but, but, but try to get it internalized because these are the main orders that we like, want you to know about um, that characterize the development of fishes evolutionarily and, and help you understand the diversity of fishes today. And so the first group are the osteoglossomorpha or the bony tongues, which include arapaima, arowana and uh, elephant fishes. Uh, I believe arapaima and um, elephant fishes are from the Amazon River Basin. I think arowana are found also in Eurasia, or excuse me, Asia. Um, you may have seen these in aquariums. If you've been to the Amazon, you may have seen these. It, um, these are also kept occasionally as an aquarium fish. They're kind of remarkable because they have a strategy of using a, a small, a, a very, um, a very light electrical field um, to uh, detect shapes in the water around them. So they navigate through the water, which often in the Amazon is quite muddy. They use this electrical field to find their way. And that strategy of using electricity is something that we see evolving over and over again in the fishes. It's, it's really cool. Uh, the elopomorpha includes the uh, North American eel, which is a catadromous fish as opposed to salmon. Salmon and lamprey spawn upstream in freshwater and they go down to live their adult life in, sea in the ocean. These do the opposite. They, 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 uh, they develop in freshwater and then go to the ocean to spawn. Uh, it includes moray eels, a reef fish, and then a tarpon, which is a fish that you may be familiar with if you're from the Southeast, a great sport fish, kind of fabulous animal. And then uh, kind of one of our favorite groups in California here at the Oster Astariophysids, um, which include the cyprinids uh, uh, or minnows. Now, minnows does not mean baby fish. Uh, in, in the general public, people call any small silverfish a minnow, but technically a minnow is actually a, a cyprinid. Um, and the cyprinid, this is a, a split tail. Cyprinids include things like goldfish and carp. Um, and they are extremely diverse, very abundant uh, organism found on pretty much every continent except Antarctica. Um, it includes um, electric eels, the gymnotiformes. Uh, it includes the chirassins, which are like tetras, probably something you know from aquarian fish, um, mostly South American. And of course, the catfish, which have a kind of global distribution at this point. Um, and that's all I have to say about those. Um, the other group, uh, another group are the clupeomorphs. You know clupeomorphs from uh, Kippert snaps, from tin cans, <laughs> largely. Um, herring, uh, sardines, and this is a, a shad, a threadfin shad. Um, these fish tend to be filter feeders. And so they form, you know, in the food web of fishes, these are kind of at the bottom forming the base of the food web and are very important fish for for uh, piscivorous fishes. 
The, protocom the protocanthopterygians include the pike, uh, salmon, and trout, and they're characterized by, at least in part, the salmonids are characterized by the adipose fin, among other things. Um, of course, these are very important uh, economically, culturally, and um, culinarily. Protocanthopterygians. The stenopterygians are probably the most abundant fish that you've never ever heard of. Uh, they probably, by biomass, they probably constitute the largest group that we're uh, of fishes. Period. Um, they're deep sea fishes that um, that occur uh, in the uh, yeah. They're deep sea fishes, and uh, they basically feed off of thing marine snow and dying organisms that float down to the bottom. And in spite of their ferocious look, most of them are quite tiny, but they're extremely dominant at the uh, abyssal layers, or maybe not the abyssal layers, but at the, um, yeah, actually, I guess at the abyssal layers, like below the penetration of light, I was thinking, hey, all, they're not so far down as to be on the very, very bottom of the trenches, but they are quite low in the water column. And so marine snow, uh, comes down, drifts down, uh, or migrating invertebrates like copepod or other zooplankton. And they're well set up to be able to capture this. These ferocious looking jaws with all those spiny teeth doesn't really necessarily make them a predator. It's really a feature of optimizing their opportunity to catch whatever comes down. Because whatever comes down, they need to catch it. They may not have a second try, right? So they tend to be kind of slow moving, sluggish fishes. They hang out and they wait, they wait. They can wait a long time because it's cold down there. And they're they're very, you know, they have very low metabolism, but uh, when food drifts down, they nail it. And you can see the upward facing eyes, the large underslung jaw, all those structures help them uh, be successful in getting food. Another group are the Cyclosquamata, a very, a very strange group that includes the lizard fish. Uh, and also the, uh, the spider or the tripod spider fish, which I threw in there just to give you an example of how weird and radiated, like how these adaptive radiations can result in really strange structures. So here are the, the, the rays of this fish have been modified to become walking stilts, which they use to clumber along the bottom in the deep sea, which is where they live. Another deep sea fish are the scopilomorphs. Um, these, uh, these fishes are adapted to depth largely through, well, they have the large mouths and large eyes that you can see, the large eyes to be able to see at depth and the large mouths to, um, to be able to effectively capture prey, which I suspect are so plankton. Um, because they're very small fishes. And then they also have the innovation of photophores. They have light systems, which allows them to signal each other and stay in contact, presumably. Uh, the lampreomorphs is another uh, unusual group, which includes the opas and the oarfish. For many years, oarfish were only known from the carcasses that washed up on beaches. They're an enormous animal. Uh, they can be 12 or 14 meters. Is that right? No, I'm sorry, it's an exaggeration. They can be like eight to 10 meters long at most, probably. But there's lots of pictures on the internet of like 14 people hanging out holding a dead or fish. And until recently, we just didn't really know what they looked like when they're alive, but they're kind of extraordinary. Uh, and then the Paracanthopterygii, these are included in here because they include the toadfish and why not, but also because they include the cod. Uh, the cod is typical, can be identified by its unusual set of three dorsal fins and they're um, of note because cod were responsible for um, the, um, Cod were responsible for, to some degree, for the colonization of North America as Europeans sought to um, find uh, food resources to support them. And so the cod was an enormous fishery. Uh, it crashed a, a couple of decades ago, uh, likely due to, to overfishing uh, and climate change as well. Uh, and finally, we end up with the Acanthopterygii, and we're coming kind of to the close of things here. These are the sort of these are sort of the most diverse and highly derived group of fishes, um, and they're characterized by another evolutionary innovation, uh, which are their um, their round, bony spines. So in this case, the the ray fins at the at the uh, um, the front edge. Um, 
of the um, <laughs> of their fins, those spines have evolved a much more rigid uh, structure. Um, and that has allowed them many different opportunities to be able to diversify those, these, these, because the, the, the spines exist on the dorsal fin and the pectoral fins and the pelvic fins in some cases. And so they're a really important anti-predator defense. And of course, something that may evolve as an anti-predator anti -predator defense gives an opportunity to, uh, to provide other opportunities for diversification. So fish use them as structures to manipulate their environment, to, to hold themselves in burrows, to fasten themselves to habitat. Um, and, um, and this characterizes the uh, Acanthopterygii in terms of their being uniquely and wildly diversified. Uh, the group can be divided into the atherinomorphs and the percomorphs. The atherinomorphs um, or atherinids um, include the flying, just mostly surface dwelling fishes, includes the flying fish, true silver sides, and live bears, the pasilids, which include things like mosquito fish, which are used for vector control all over the world, um, uh, guppies, and also like California killifish, rainwater killifish. Um, they've also diversified into, uh, well, in diverse, Excuse me. I really, I really am tired. Uh, into um, deep, so these deep bodies, um, these sort of percoform like shape with a very disc like body that's very uh, uh, laterally flattened or compressed, uh, suits itself for coral reefs or any kind of rocky reef structure. And so that's what we see uh, uh, in, in reefs. We see a lot of these fishes that are developed like that. And they use their caudal fin, but also their pectoral fins for um, both uh, moving through the water as well as navigating sharp corners and the structure of the body allows them to do fast turns. Uh, and that is, gives them, um, one, the ability to navigate a complex environment and also to specialize in predator evasion. Uh, and also this group also includes the California state fish, which is the Garibaldi. Um, open water pelagic hunters, uh, these fishes went in a completely different direction. Instead of being ventrally, uh, excuse me, laterally compressed, these fish are shaped like missiles. So they've got this tuniform shape. Um, and so uh, the lifestyle of these fishes is such that, especially in the case of tuna, they migrate at high speeds for many, many hundreds or thousands of miles in the course of a lifetime. So they're designed for that sort of niche. And same could be said of mahi-mahi, which are open water pelagic predators. They've got a sort of fusiform body shape uh, that allows them high speeds to be able to catch their prey. Um, another uh, group are the scorpinidae or the, uh, or the um, sorry, the scorpinidae, also known as the sebastidae. Um, there's some dispute about the, about the taxonomy, which is not surprising, uh, which include the California rockfishes. There's a, a, an amazingly diverse group of rockfishes. These are uh, uh, kind of bottom dwellers on the coastal shelf, so they're not at terribly deep depths. They're right on the coastal shelf, but they have this amazing diversity of fishes that uh, is California's kind of ground zero for. Um, and they're basically benthic uh, foragers and predators with those large mouths. They're lay in wait predators and um, they use those mouths to suck in their prey. It also includes things like lionfish or turkey fish, which have another, yet another adaptation of these rays. Their spines are poisonous and have been adapted as an extreme defensive mechanism. Um, another group of highly adapted uh, fishes are the pl pleuronectiforms, which are the flat fish, bottom dwelling fishes. These fishes, developmentally within the life of an individual, um, start off um, start off aligned um, dorsal ventrally erect in the water column with eyes on two sides of their body. And as they develop through their lifespan, one of the eyes starts to migrate to the other side. And the fish at that point is able to, um, to uh, lie down on the benthos uh, and be able to, um, to look up with both eyes. And so in short, uh, one eye migrates around the body and comes up and joins the other. And there are left-sided flatfish and there are right-sided flatfish as it turns out. 
And then the tetraodontiformes is a really weird group. It includes puffer fishes, includes trigger fishes, and includes the mola mola. Another uh, a kind of a kind of a broad group that includes a lot of just really bizarre, highly radiated fishes. Um, so that's it for the fish lecture. And then I talked a little bit more about our artsy fartsy uh, kind of traditions here. Uh, Peter Moyle and Gary Snyder, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, for Turtle Island, his collection of poetry, uh, got to know each other in the 1980s. And uh, they hung out uh, up in uh, the Sierras at Kikitzadi. Um, where they brought classes. And actually a lot of professors from WFC started going up there and thinking about the interrelationship between nature and culture. And uh, a lot of interesting ideas about watersheds and, 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 and um, relationships to the, to the land came out of that group. Um, and uh, Gary Snyder had an abiding interest in poetry. That's what he's became famous for. He was a, so he was a beat poet. He knew Jack Kerouac and Ellen Ginsberg. And uh, so he had gone to Japan and studied poetry. He had studied Zen. And um, so he came back with this like passion for poetry in the landscape. And so Peter kind of picked up on it and he got really into haikus. This is an example of a, of a haiku by uh, Matsuo Basho, who's kind of considered to be the master of Japanese haiku. And I particularly like this one. What, what fish feel, birds feel, I don't know, the year ending. And that kind of, um, that, that kind of structure really characterizes a haiku. Um, the idea is that a haiku, haiku is typically 17 syllables. You've got lines of five, seven, five, but it's not so much the syllable count as the, as the essentialization of an idea. And the idea that is a surprising twist at the end that makes you rethink your consciousness about something. Um, I'll give you another one here. This is by Peter. If I learn your name, if I, if I learn your name, a fish name is forgotten, like a small haiku. So that's Peter's attempt at a little bit of humor and a twist on it that you might not expect from a fish class. Um, and then the other artsy fartsy stuff is that right when, when Peter Moyle was teaching here, a lot of uh, pretty famous art, artists, including Robert Arneson, who, who did the bubble, the, um, the egg heads on campus, uh, Wayne Thiebaud, who does landscapes and, and desserts, foods, with this kind of post-impressionistic style. Uh, Bruce Nauman, who was sort of a conceptual artist who kind of does, does everything and kind of embodies what the Shrem Museum is all about. Um, we're all around here at the same time. And um, I think the, the kind of art, it was a very fruitful and productive time for artistic traditions at UC Davis in the 80s and even in the 90s. And uh, I think Peter caught the fever. And so he started introducing into his fish classes um, the idea of fish and art. And he and his wife, Marilyn, wrote a whole series of monographs on fish imagery and art. Um, and so we'll go through some of that and uh, get a sense of painting from uh, prehistoric works like cave painting and from pottery shards um, up all the way through oil painting and the old masters and the impressionists and the post-impressionists and up and hopefully into contemporary stuff as well. But that's why we do it. It's an old UC Davis tradition in the fish class and it has this grounding in the culture of the campus, which I think is really great. Uh, next time we meet, we'll talk about external morphology and function in fishes. And thanks again for putting up with the, uh, the confusion around, um, around the, uh, the assembly of my videos.